Hello and welcome to day two of the 2020 World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. I'm Srimathi Sridhar live from the World Bank Atrium in Washington, D.C. And today is all about sustainability, specifically seizing opportunities to incorporate climate, nature and social inclusion into the COVID-19 recovery. Now, all this week, we want you to use your voice, vote in our polls, send us your comments and ask us your questions. Here now to talk about how you can involve is our social media guru, Papsi Mariano. Papsi, Hi, Shree. Welcome back. Thanks. So, you know, Papsi, today is the second day of the meeting. So briefly tell us, how did yesterday go? You're across the conversations on World Bank Live, on social media. So what are the highlights? So the topic on debt was a popular one. We actually got over 6,000 votes on our poll. So that's awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, and a highlight for me personally was President Malpass being here on set, further explaining why we need long-term solutions to address the debt crisis. Um, and of course, I was watching on the side and Idris Elba's yes. video um, calling on um, government and international organizations to work together to support the most vulnerable, especially in this time of COVID. COVID-19. Um, and especially, I, I, I really liked your interview with the country director from Mozambique. She was awesome. She's fantastic, isn't she? Um, so, Pepsi, you know, we've got a team that is answering, looking at the questions that folks are sending in online. But the best questions have a chance of making it down here to the live show to be answered later on by some expert guests. So as folks craft their questions, you know, is there anything they should keep in mind? Well, definitely make it relevant for today's event. So again, as you mentioned, it's all about sustainable recovery. So please use the hashtag for today, people and planet. Um, just be sincere with your questions. Keep it brief. And our colleagues who are, who are monitoring these will definitely pick it up. That's great. And, uh, you know, briefly tell us there is so much going on online. So how can folks best engage with us this year? Definitely um, simply check out all of our social media accounts. But most of all, go to World Bank Live where everything is happening. So bookmark um, the events, set an email reminder to your calendars and take advantage of the live chat. Um, go ask your Absolutely. questions and share your ideas. Perfect. Well, Papsi, thank you so much for being here. Sure. Well, folks, over the past few months, the COVID-19 pandemic has destroyed lives, livelihoods and economies. Now, that has many wondering, how can countries bring about recoveries that benefit people and planet? Now, that's just one of the many questions we'll be answering today. And to do just that, let me hand it over momentarily to journalist Zane Vergie to our main event, a sustainable recovery for people and planet. Now, we'll be back here live in a about an hour's time, but in the meantime, Zane, take it away. Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today to discuss one of the most pressing development challenges of our day. How can countries recover from the coronavirus pandemic while also addressing climate change and biodiversity loss? My name is Zane Vergy and I will be moderating today's event. Over the next hour, we're going to be exploring what a sustainable recovery from the pandemic could look like for both people and planet. We're going to hear from a range of speakers, from ministers and CEOs to young voices and civil society. They're going to share their thoughts on what a sustainable future could look like and how we can get from here to there. Here's a taste of what we have in store.
We really want you to be part of the conversation, and there are a number of ways you can engage. We're streaming live in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic on World Bank Live, where we are answering your questions right now. And we'll be running a live poll throughout this event, so stay tuned for more details on that. It's all happening at World Bank Live. Stay tuned at the end of this event for a special live show from the World Bank Group headquarters. It's really going to be a great chance for you to dive even deeper into some of the issues we're about to discuss. The conversation has already started. Please use the hashtag people and planet to share your thoughts throughout this event. Let me start by welcoming World Bank Group President David Malpass to open today's event, which comes as countries are struggling to get past the pandemic, which has devastated communities and economies. David, why is it so important for countries to plan a recovery that delivers on jobs and growth, but also builds resilience in people and the environment and does not leave anyone behind? Hi, thank you, Zane. Well, the, the, uh, the COVID crisis is making clear uh, some of the problems that were already there, but that are that are even clearer now. The, the problems of uh, water services, for example, that are so important in fighting COVID, access to food is important. And all of these, there's been underinvestment. Uh, and so this creates a big challenge in living conditions that would have been there even without COVID, but is made that much worse. Also, the, the information, uh, uh, the, the, there's a vacuum or, or not enough information, and especially in some of the poorest countries. So we're trying to address all of those. Uh, but uh, one, one, of the, one of the big challenges uh, is that a lot of the natural systems have been neglected over the years. And so that can be the pollution in water, the pollution in air, the, the climate events that are more and more frequent, the, the water quality, uh, marine plastics, uh, all of these are, are uh, challenges. A new one that COVID brought out is the jump uh, from animals to people or that, that people have talked about within the COVID crisis of, of how, how can uh, uh, viruses uh, spread and will that cause a repeated uh, pandemic kind of problem or or challenge? Uh, I, I do have to say, uh, you know, some positives come out when when the world's faced with challenges. There are there are new positives, new constructive ways, and certainly technology has been trying. Uh, I think rising to the occasion in terms of information technology, uh, but none of the threats have go gone away. And the big challenge is how do we build back greener, uh, green, build back better in a new environment as we come out of the recovery. People need to, I think make the right investments now, ones that benefit people, uh, ones that create low carbon stimulus, for example, that can really help people both grow and uh, uh, make progress on the, on the resource needs that the planet has. So that's all uh, some of the challenges that we face out of the COVID uh, crisis. How is the World Bank Group actually working with countries to respond to this crisis and recover sustainably? One of the things we've been trying to do is reduce the number of uh, subsidies and the, the cost of environmental uh, uh, of, of, of subsidies. For example, when a country holds down the price of gasoline, it has a combined problem because it's a fiscal expense uh, and it's a, it's a, it distorts the way the economy works. And very importantly, it's a giant environmental problem. So trying to combine all of these into country programs that work is one of our goals. We've been able to be the largest multilateral lender uh, in terms of, uh, of climate uh, resources. Uh, over the last five years, the World Bank uh, committed $83 billion of climate-related investments, which has, which has been giantly helpful to the world. It also goes along with uh, programs that benefit in terms of clean water, uh, in terms of access to digital information, access to electricity. These are, these are uh, uh, very important as people try to combat or, or respond 
to both the, the poverty uh, and also the environmental and climate challenges that the countries face. Though we, we've, we've led a biodiversity uh, uh, initiatives, uh, in, including um, uh, the marine and coastal protected areas and also terrestrial pr protected areas. These are big initiatives to protect actual physical, physical land. And then also our pro-green and pro-blue initiatives have been, uh, uh, have been very effective in bringing resources together to focus on these problems. So some of the critical lessons that we're trying to bring out, first, that people are, are critical in their attitudes, their ability to interact uh, with their own governments, with their programs in a transparent way. These have been very important. Also, what we've tried to do is have a system or a country, a country partnership framework where working together with the government, the various uh, uh, donors and uh, concerned groups, civil society organizations, all work together to provide a, an economy-wide uh, solution to some of the problems. And we've also looked in, and uh, been innovative in terms of the instruments that are available. One, for example, in Rwanda, we've, uh, we've been uh, engaged in a natural capital as part of the national planning exercise. So that's an important concept that brings together quite a few of the different expertise of the, of the World Bank. And we've also, uh, for example, in Fiji, uh, developed the country's first climate vulnerability assessment, uh, which is uh, a starting point for attacking the problem. There needs to be an assessment that, uh, that brings in information and data and also the country's own situation in order to tackle the problem. So I, I'm looking forward to today to, to hearing the speakers on why they think a sustainable recovery is important and also how can we be true partners uh, in helping everyone achieve it. And so that's the, that's the goal and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. I'm Vika in Fiji and you're watching World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. As promised, we are now going to open our poll for this session. The question we're asking is, what should a sustainable recovery focus on? For the purposes of this poll, we've had to narrow the choices down to four options. Here they are. Number one, boosting jobs. Number two, helping the poorest. Number three, supporting low carbon economies. And lastly, protecting nature. I know that's quite a tough choice, right? You'll be able to take part and see how the votes are stacking up at World Bank Live. What does a sustainable recovery actually mean in practical terms for people's lives? What challenges and opportunities does it present for communities already struggling to respond to the coronavirus? That is what we've asked community leaders from around the world. And here's what some of them had to say. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the world dramatically. The virus and its consequences are hitting the poorest of the poor the hardest. The virus has not only caused a health crisis, but also an economic hunger and poverty crisis of huge proportions. What is needed is the solidarity of the international community and global answers. The World Bank has a key role in this. In the next few years, it will invest $160 billion in the recovery. There is a need for emergency aid to strengthen health systems and prevent a famine, assistance to help protect jobs and stabilize government budgets, and a recovery program that is in line with the SDG agenda and the Paris Agreement. The recovery programs must be climate friendly and sustainable. We want to do our part to make that happen. For me, a sustainable future is one where the current generation can meet its needs without uh, compromising the ability of the future generations to meet theirs when the time comes. 
Uh, currently, climate change is uh, impacting almost all sectors of Kenya's economy, both directly and indirectly, through frequent floods, droughts, uh, landscape degradation, loss of di biodiversity, and critical ecosystems which provide essential services to communities across the country. It's my vision uh, for the future is to remodel the currently dominant economic paradigm into one of increasing material well-being, improving reliance on technological fixes to environmental degradation, and ensuring reduction of poverty and other social problems by continuous economic growth. For me, a sustainable future always leads back to purpose. Purpose on a governmental level, societal and industry level. My journey as an activist started when I was 12 years old, when I set out to make my island home of Bali plastic bag free. Today, my work is all about empowering more young people to become young change makers. We use the 17 SDG goals as a framework and the knowledge and experience of the frontline existing young change makers, building that into a program, peer-to-peer -peer content for the rising young change maker. If there's one thing confirmed by COVID-19 is that we can no longer go back to business as usual. There is no normal, no new normal, just better normal. We have to accelerate the solutions we wish to see in our world today. Inspiring words. We'll be hearing more from other community champions later on, but I'd like to for now pick up on Malati's idea of a better normal for our first discussion. I'm joined by Minister Ayaz Saeed Kayum, the Minister for Economy, Civil Service and Communications in Fiji, and Helen Mountford, Vice President for Climate and Economics at the World Resources Institute. I'd like to ask both of you about balancing multiple priorities to make the recovery sustainable, resilient and inclusive. Minister Saeed Kayum, Fiji is no stranger to the need for resilience to natural disasters and the whole building back better approach. So can you tell us more about this thinking and how exactly it informs government policy? Thank you. And, you know, it's a pleasure being here on, on this panel. Um, tragedy essentially has taught countries like us that, in particular those countries on the front lines of climate change, uh, that building back better is a question of life or death because if you don't do so, um, you have uh, this continuous cycle of rebuilding uh, each time after new uh, climate exacerbated or induced uh, events. In 2016, we had the Cyclone Winston. It wiped off one third of the value of our GDP uh, within 36 hours. Um, and since then, of course, I mean, actually what happened, when that happened, we realized we had to build back better. And in fact, it paid off because we've had seven cyclones since then, um, but those structures we build back better, in fact, have not been damaged uh, after in those seven cyclones. The, the point though is that, you know, specifically, it's not only about a matter of good uh, domestic governance, it also needs to become a standard, you know, throughout the global financial system. Because as you would understand, to build back better, uh, you know, you need to be able to have the money up front and the multilateral financial institutions need to structurally revaluate the financial in incentives of building resilience. Because without these changes, the short-term cost to small developing countries of building of building like better actually will become unaffordable, you know, even as we continue to suffer extreme climatic devastation. Of course, this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, we had a, a cyclone in the middle of when we had cases out in the community some months back. Thankfully, we are now about 163 days without a COVID-19 you know, case within the community, but we still have the continuous problem of you know, climatic pressures put on us. And uh, the reality is that building it better is more critical than ever. And in that context, uh, Ms. Mountford, the conversation that we're having now is taking place against this really serious backdrop of accelerating climate and biodiversity crisis and the, the urgency of this is pretty clear. So can you share with us what you see as the key stakes in getting this right? Absolutely. As the minister said, the climate and biodiversity crisis did not go into quarantine with COVID-19. They're continuing to hit communities and people around the world 
from tropical storms to raging wildfires to life-threatening floods. So climate action and ecosystem protection really are essentially what we think of as an insurance policy to, the ri to reduce the risks of future pandemics and other catastrophes. And they pay off. The Global Commission on Adaptation found that investments in climate adaptation can deliver between two to 10 times the returns for each dollar spent. So the urgency is really clear, but we also have an important moment now when we can actually reset our economies and build back in a way that tackles these crises and the COVID-19 crisis together. Governments and institutions like the World Bank and IMF are expected to invest something like $12 trillion in COVID response and economic recovery. This is an important window when we can invest this in approaches that deliver the clean air that we can breathe, transport solutions that put an end to urban congestion, more productive agriculture and clean water for all. And the good news is that these are often the solutions that also deliver the jobs that we so desperately need. Investing in renewable energy or energy efficiency, for example, can deliver over double the jobs as coal or gas investments. Similarly for green transport options and nature-based solutions. So these are the solutions we need to seize now. Minister, talk to us a little bit about how Pacific nations can cooperate amongst each other and build greater resilience. What's been your experience? Well, no, we, uh, the Pacific has for a long time you know, spoken with one voice on the urgency of mitigating and adapting to climate change. I mean, we, of course, our carbon footprint is almost negligible, but we are the cold base of climate change, in, in fact, the climatic events. Uh, prior to the Paris Agreement, we collectively pushed for the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, the only target which would keep most of our communities actually habitable. We also strove to make Fiji's presidency of COP23 a truly Pacific presidency by using, you know, uh, what we call the Talanoa Dialogues to facilitate active listening, storytelling, and collaborative problem solving. Uh, when it comes to building resilience, I mean, I have to highlight this, often the small scale of our markets, lack of economies of scale, or what they call bankable project, uh, projects, means traditional risk instruments and products actually are not built for the purpose of, you know, small states like the Pacific or in the Caribbean for that matter even. A smaller scale, however, does, does make it harder to diversify risk and attract investment, but doesn't make it impossible because we've sort of said there could be what we call cross-border collaboration. And over the past few years, Fiji has piloted a, piloted a number of uh, innovative financial instruments, for example, the Green Bond, which is now listed on the London Stock Exchange, and we have a climate, uh, sorry, environment and climate adaptation levy. Um, we To scale up, and this is coming from the COP23 uh, participation and uh, following that uh, the other COPs, to scale up capacity for innovation, we are developing what we call the Drew Incubator, uh, which will be a dedicated hub for coordinating and developing innovative financial uh, instruments to support resilient uh, development in Fiji and, of course, uh, beyond that too. We, we have a number of initiatives, and I think, uh, for example, we're looking at the decarbonizing our uh, Pacific shipping, uh, through direct support for initiatives that will help us uh, leverage the private sector investment. So I think from that perspective, given okay. that we have a lot of commonality uh, within the Pacific, uh, we'll be able to uh, realize what I call a lot of the unrealized potential uh, that we have by having some, you know, uh, translating these initiatives into financing uh, uh, innovative products. And, and on that, uh, Ms. Mountford, uh, when we look at this phrase that I've heard a lot of uh, recently, a whole of economy approach, what does it mean exactly? What can countries do? Just unpack it and drill down a little bit for us. Thank you, Zane. It means basically that you can't have a climate policy that is separate from your economic growth strategy. The two need to be fully integrated to deliver the stronger, fairer, and more resilient growth that we want. The new climate economy project, for example, found that investing in bold climate action could deliver $26 trillion in net economic benefits over the next 10 years, boosting jobs, driving down poverty and saving lives. And if designed well with phase out of fossil fuel subsidies and smart carbon pricing, it can also deliver substantial revenues to health countries to manage a just transition and the fiscal shortfalls that we know are coming. The Indonesian government, for example, has recently identified similar benefits for its own economy from an ambitious low-carbon development path and taken steps to integrate this at the heart 
of their next five-year economic development plan. This is a path that others need to follow. And the good news is that help is at hand. The NDC partnership with the support of uh, partners like the World Bank and ourselves at the World Resources Institute are working to place economic advisors directly into ministries of finance, economy and planning in 32 countries, including Fiji, to help the governments identify green recovery opportunities. Beyond this, the global financial system really needs to be reformed to better identify and manage such risks. Already we're seeing some investors, central banks and others waking up to these risks and demanding transparent disclosure of climate and other risks, stress testing and proper pricing of risks. But there's also a really important uh, role for the World Bank and the IMF in this. They must integrate climate action at the center of their economic policy and financial support to countries during the recovery and after and into their surveillance processes. This is the time to help countries build back smarter, fairer and more resilient. So I'm very glad we're discussing it here at the annual meetings. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Helen Mountford, Minister Ayaz Saeed Kayum. thank you so much for your time and for your thoughts. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jairo Bedoya in San Jose de Ure in Colombia, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meeting. A quick mention of another fun opportunity to engage. As you know, a resilient recovery is the theme of these meetings, and we're asking you to send us photos of what resilience means to you. We're adding these pictures to a virtual mosaic. So see how that's shaping up and upload your own pictures at our website. We're going to spend a lot of time at these meetings discussing new ways to support a resilient recovery, but there are lots of great ideas and initiatives that are already in action. Take a look at this for some inspiration. 2020, a global pandemic, a health and economic crisis like no other, a year also set to be the hottest on record, with wildfires burning and record numbers of plants and animals near extinction, while zoonotic diseases are on the rise. But even despite COVID-19, 2020 could mark a turning point, a once-in-a-generation chance to invest in fairer, cleaner, greener, and safer growth for people and planet. The World Bank Group can help countries respond to these crises and make vital investments in a more sustainable future. We are restoring degraded seascapes, providing research to help countries better value nature and address the drivers of biodiversity loss, including market distorting subsidies. We are being creative, getting new players, new partners, and the private sector into the fight, jumpstarting green markets from new products to bonds and insurance, developing nature based solutions to the climate crisis. Green factories and industries that create jobs. Pushing for greater efficiency that saves energy and reduces greenhouse gases. This is changing communities and countries. We are supporting people. Through cleaner air to breathe and safe water to drink that fosters a healthy life. Finding ways they can adapt because emergency response systems can work for a pandemic recovery and when a natural disaster strikes. And have jobs in a new and sustainable green economy. Ingénieur, ingénieur industriel et productique. La première fois, c'est on est 50 personnes et je suis la seule fille. We are ambitious, helping change laws and policies. But more important, change minds that thriving and growing go hand in hand with healing and restoring the planet as the world changes we must all change reimagine a future that is safe environmentally sound and inclusive in every sector industry 
and region. To share our knowledge, our skills, our resources, and work together with partners to push for more. For her and him. For them. For people and planet. Be ambitious with us. Thank you so much for joining us as we look at how a sustainable recovery could work for people and planet. This is the second public event of our World Bank Group annual meetings, which are focusing on supporting a resilient recovery from the coronavirus crisis. We really hope that you'll join us throughout the week for some really important and engaging conversations. You can see the complete schedule at World Bank Live. And to comment on any of the events, you can use the hashtag Resilient Recovery. A reminder, too, that we'll be putting your questions live straight after this event to Mari Pangestu, the World Bank's Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships, and Hans-Peter Lankis, IFC's Vice President of Economics and Private Sector Development. Okay, let's get back to the guests. The global downturn in the wake of this pandemic has hit employment around the world. So a sustainable recovery has to deliver good jobs in the short term, as well as reduce emissions and boost resilience in the long term. To talk about how that can be achieved and how people and livelihoods are part of the solution, I'm joined now from Mexico by Tania Ortiz Mena, CEO of Ienova Infrastructura Energetica. So great to have you here today. Tania, how do you see your company's role in supporting the country's energy transition toward a more sustainable mix? Thank you, Sain, and good morning. Um, Mexico is a very interesting country with regards to its energy mix. It's a very large economy. It's a population over 125 million people. It's a growing economy, an industrialized economy. So we need to ensure that we have a sustainable energy supply. And that's where my company has a very important role to play. Mexico has very rich solar and wind resources, and we have been very focused in developing those resources to generate energy, not only for the state electric utility, but also for industrial consumers that want to have clean and affordable energy. I'm very proud to say that we partnered with IFC and we were the first Mexican company to obtain a green loan by the IFC. So today, my company represents roughly 10% of the market share. And in addition, we've also made very important progress in developing natural gas infrastructure for Mexico to allow it to switch from heavier fuels to cleaner natural gas. So we're certainly a part of the energy uh, transition in Mexico. So you, have, you have a very solid sustainability model. Could you just describe it to us and, and share with us what you've learned? Yes, L let me tell you a story. Sustainability is part of our DNA. Uh, the company uh, that I lead uh, went public in 2013, we did our IPO. So immediately after um, we IPO, to my surprise, I received a call from the Mexican Stock Exchange explaining that they would do a sustainability audit. I did not know that was coming. It was a complete shock, but we basically opened our doors and allowed the Mexican Stock Exchange to review our sustainability uh, practices, policies, et cetera. And uh, we became since then part of Mexico's Stock Exchange Sustainability Index. So it was already part of our culture and we've continued uh, to, to achieve uh, or, or to propose higher metrics, uh, higher standards in sustainability. And it's part of what we do every day, both with regards to support of our communities, protection of the environment, but also promoting economic development in Mexico and best corporate uh, governance practices. What would be your, your greatest takeaway if you were to share lessons that you've learned with other energy companies in the region? What would be, what would be the one thing? In terms of sustainability, I would summarize it by saying, do the right thing. Do the right thing even when no one is watching. And when you're an energy company, doing the right thing means caring for your community. 
it means protecting the environment and uh, it means following the best corporate governance practices. Energy companies take a very long-term view on their business. And in order to be successful long-term, you need to incorporate sustainability into everything that you do every day. Given the current COVID context though, and some of the immediate economic pressures that countries are facing, how do you as a CEO or as a company reconcile really important short-term objectives and reconcile them with the longer term climate and sustainability goals? How, how, do, you, how do you get that balance? The challenge related uh, to the pandemic is, uh, has a, a very uh, particular impact on energy companies because on one hand, I mean, for me, my number one priority is the health and well-being of my team. We have 1,600 employees in Mexico and every night I get a report ensuring that all of us are healthy. Many of us are working for home, but in the energy industry, you need to keep the plants running because you need to keep the lights on. So that means that we do have a lot of people out in the field and we're also responsible for them. So it's a combination between obviously prioritizing and ensuring that your people are healthy, but also implementing different ways of working, different protocols, so that literally we can keep the lights on. So we have a great responsibility for right. our country. Thank you very much, Tanya Ortiz Mena. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to Ms. Ortiz Mena. Clean energy is also a priority for the government of Costa Rica, which has adopted a long-term decarbonization strategy. Maria del Pilar Garrido Gonzalo is the Minister of National Planning and Economic Policy, and she shared her country's vision with us via a video message. Greetings from Costa Rica. As President Alvarado recently said, the pandemic is an accelerator of change. We now have the opportunity to link post-COVID-19 recovery plans with solutions to climate change. In the case of Costa Rica, we use the decarbonization plan as a centerpiece to address the COVID crisis and to recover better. The decarbonization plan is a strategic document that offers a roadmap for a new development model and to respond to the demands of the fourth industrial revolution and at the same time to respond to the climate and biodiversity crisis in a systemic way. It highlights the need to move towards a sustainable economy based on three Ds, digitalization, decentralization in the electricity production and decarbonization. It is our goal to be a net emissions country in 2050. We understand that decarbonization and resilience is not a burden to the development, but it is a new opportunity to give it a new sense of direction. Countries can design the recovery phase taking into account other strategies, such as the following, intensifying the use of renewable energy and energy efficiency at a competitive cost, leveraging the dynamism of public investment in order to build climate resilient works, promoting the new productive activities of green growth that enable the rapid post-COVID recovery for its high added value. Now let's take a moment to hear from some more community champions and leaders for their vision of a sustainable recovery. For me, a sustainable future means being able to live in a world that is safe, secure and livable. And it also means being able to live in a world whereby my generation and all generations to come will not have to bear the consequences of the actions of previous generations. And it also means being able to live in a world whereby the entire human race is in harmony with nature. And this is definitely possible if we put people and our planet before profits. As the founder of Green Generation Initiative that focuses on nurturing young people to love nature and be conscious of the environment at a young age, and as the coordinator of Daima Coalition that is led by Wangari Mathai Foundation and is focusing on creating an appreciation for the value of green spaces and also making sure that people protect the green spaces, that I am focused on making sure that we attain the sustainable future. I do believe that we can build back better by incorporating green spaces 
into our green recovery and I believe that we can also build back better if we listen to the voices of the young people that are trying to champion for change in terms of environmental conservation and together we can win this war against the climate and ecological crisis. There's a lot of uh, uncertainties in this moment and we don't know when the full recovery from COVID-19 uh, will happen but uh, we need to plan for it right now. I think uh, this is a once in a lifetime to, uh, chance uh, to reset our relationship with nature. At the same time, it's an opportunity to scale up invest investments in nature-based solutions uh, that can help our forests, our lands and oceans uh, to absorb uh, carbon and protect our biodiversity. Friends uh, and colleagues, uh, nobody can prosper in a sick planet. We'll need to recognize that it's in our own self-interest to protect and invest in nature. I'm so pleased to have the chance uh, to work uh, to help you, uh, the world, ensure that the COVID recovery is a sustainable one. These uh, will be the Global Environmental Facility's singular focus on this coming year, and I know we can achieve uh, the goal together. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Sustainable development is inclusive, reflective, forward-looking, and responsible development for future and current generations that also builds and maintains environmental integrity. This is exactly the case of Ghana's Cocoa Forest Replas program. We've come from a past of deforestation, forest degradation, non-collaborative forest management, and losses in agricultural production into transformative landscape programs that restore agricultural production, restore degraded forests, and also provide alternative and additional livelihood support for our communities whilst raising climate ambition. Now more than ever, we feel a need to rise out of the COVID-19 pandemic by building back better because we have seen the very essence of our forest. My greatest assurance of success is in the strong and collaborative partnerships we have built, particularly the private sector and our local communities. For me, a sustainable future means achieving the 2050 vision of the Convention on Biological Diversity, living in harmony with nature. This year, parties to the Convention were supposed to adopt a new global framework for biodiversity, but COVID-19 has delayed that. The pandemic is a visceral reminder of why we so urgently need this framework. More than just a set of targets, we need a framework that will drive the transformational change we need to rebalance our relationship with nature and build resilient communities and economies. That is why we are using this unexpected extra time to reach out to more and different partners. We need to engage all government ministries, the financial sector, in fact, all sectors of society. I trust the discussions at the World Bank annual meetings will help us to build new partnerships for this transformation. Thank you. I'm Adina Mamraeva in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meeting. If you've just joined us, welcome. I'm Zane Vergy, and we're discussing how to build a sustainable recovery that protects people and planet. That's also the hashtag we're using for this event, so please do share your thoughts and comments. As Elizabeth Marema said so eloquently in her video message, the next year is going to be key as new targets are set for the conservation, sustainable use, and sharing of benefits from biodiversity. Which brings us to our final discussion where our speakers are going to delve into how a sustainable recovery can restore ecosystems, reverse biodiversity loss, create better food systems and jobs all at the same time. Welcome to Minister Celso Correa, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development of Mozambique, and Diane Holdorf, MD at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Minister, let's start with you first. How has Mozambique included biodiversity and supporting nature into your planning and budgeting in the past? Actually, we, we're following a, a long-term plan. As you know, Mozambique has 25% of our land declared the conservation area. In the past years, we've suffered a lot of uh, poaching and destruction of our biodiversity. 
but we've introduced a, a, a program uh, which is called MosBio in order to bring back this uh, wealth that we have. So we have improved a lot. We have recovered uh, a lot of animals in our areas, but our strategy has been based on involving communities around these areas and make sure that communities have uh, income from from this, the projects like tourism and community agriculture. So we believe that by involving these communities, we're making a big change in the country and giving property to them in terms of controlling these areas. How have you gotten them involved more specifically, those communities? Uh, communities in, in areas that we are talking about have access to credit in order to produce. They are organized in terms of, of uh, uh, small uh, 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 villages. So all the villages are being supported in terms also of water, sex of water, and all households at the moment are, are getting involved in chains. For example, the production of honey, it's one of the, the products that is making a big difference for, for these villages. But we also have a big project called Sustenta, which comes from sustainability in Mozambique. Uh, financed by the World Bank, which is also introducing new technologies of producing without creating damage into the environment. Ms. Holdorf, what kind of role does the private sector have in financing sustainability? Thanks so much. This is such an important space for the private sector because business depends on these natural resources for its own success, but equally really for the success of the communities and it's the employees and the people who rely on business as well. And there's opportunities in preserving and protecting biodiversity through business operations. I think the minister just shared a great example of how improved agricultural practices that take biodiversity into consideration can really deliver results of increased healthier production, but also opportunities for learning and, and income uh, improvements for farmers and communities whose rural livelihoods depend on nature, and in this case, agriculture. And those are exactly the types of things that we look for, is those kinds of things that really deliver business resilience and support communities as well. What are some of the practical things that need to happen in order to make this work, financing biodiversity? Give, give us a few examples and tools. There are several that I can share. There's the example of agricultural practices which invest in soil health and biodiversity on farm to improve the water retention and the quality of water, both for the farm and for the community. There's investments into forests and forest diversity for communities that rely on forest product income. And of course, there's a lot of benefit for types of investments like into mangroves. Not only do we see improved uh, natural weather hazard risk reduction, but we see real benefits to local fisheries and, and again, community incomes. So these types of things all have very good business value and come down to very specific location benefiting practices. Minister, how are you addressing some of the challenges that Mozambique faces of improving agricultural productivity on the one hand, while avoiding the degradation of the land and, and, and the loss of biodiversity? One of the main reasons of deforestation of the country has been the practice of slash and burn in Mozambique. So by introducing these new methods of, of, of producing agriculture, we're reducing also emissions, but protecting the forestry. So this approach that we, we took the last five years has managed to reduce our emissions, also our deforestation in a big percentage. We're talking about a 20% reduction. So this is a long-term process. Most of the population practice this kind of agriculture. So we will keep on intens intensifying this transmission of, of technology into communities to make the difference. We don't pollute a lot, but we are one of the countries which is most exposed to, to climate change. As you know, uh, Idai and Kenneth, which uh, actually destroyed a lot of uh, property and families in the past two years. So we are a country that we have no choice but to 
go sustainable. And we are doing all our policies that are taking in consideration sustainability. Ms. Holdorf, how then can we have a, a nature positive recovery going forward that really builds uh, more sustainable and, and resilient food systems? I think this is the critical question, particularly as we reflect on it during this COVID recovery period. What started as a health crisis has really turned into quite an economic crisis for many countries, and this is having significant impacts across businesses and communities. We were very concerned at the beginning that it would affect food security, and in fact, the food system has proven to be a bit more resilient than we had anticipated, but nevertheless, we saw real systemic challenges in areas of nutritional security, potential risks around food price spikes, which have mostly been mitigated, but have longer term implications associated with them, and real challenges, particularly for financing to smallholders and SMEs through big global value chains. So when we think about resilience of the food system, we have to think about the stages of uh, the chain from production to storage, especially like cold chain storage and building capacity for these types of logistics capabilities at every stage. And then also thinking about those regions, as the minister was just speaking to, like Mozambique, that are particularly at risk as we look at climate change and nature loss and focusing resilience and nature positive carbon positive solutions into those regions that have the biggest risks and the biggest therefore gains to come. And that is where we see real food system resilience starting to come from and are what we're actually both investing in as well as seeking and support as governments start to put these big packages for recovery into place. Minister, with that, what would you say was the greatest lesson that you've learned on, on focusing uh, on resilience when it comes to food systems? What should be our takeaway from your experience in Mozambique? The biggest experience is that uh, I think the world has recognized that in order to achieve our goals, we must put communities in the center of this challenge. We need to involve communities at the local level and educate them uh, on benefits of taking a different path, a different approach and changing their ways of lives. So uh, the biggest takeaway uh, is to make sure that communities are involved. Thank you so much, Celsu Korea, Diane Holdorf. Appreciate your time as well as your insights on this really important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. Let me turn for the final time to our community champions and leaders to hear what inspires them to push for a sustainable recovery. To me, a sustainable future is a future where people are economically empowered and there's good health. Good health definitely, I mean, there's clean and enough water for the society. So being born and raised here in Kibera slums, um, and I started a, an organization because I was a footballer. I saw so many people losing uh, life at a tender age uh, due to crime and drugs. So uh, at the moment, due to COVID, we've been uh, supporting the same community uh, in terms of giving food, uh, sanitizer, and also offering water and hand wash points. So this one we've been targeting, our, our main cause has been people who are disabled, the elderly, and also orphan children and expectant women. So that is what we've been doing. And uh, to cap the, the pro COVID, uh, our future plan is to have a good and uh, enough training skills because most of the people that lost job during this COVID time are those people who are, are not, did not have enough skills. So at the moment that is the plan we have to train more youths and women in terms of economical empowerment to be able to sustain their lives. For me, a post-pandemic future is about a new social contract for jobs, growth and sustainability. Here in India where millions of migrant workers have gone home and millions of small businesses are in trouble, we at CEW have supported local administration on the public health response, and we are designing new pathways for a sustainable and just recovery. We've kicked off a $3 million program to support rural startups using clean energy for income generating activities. We're designing financial solutions to crowd in billions of dollars of investment into sustainable infrastructure. We're focusing on sustainable agriculture and food systems. We are focusing on urban distributed energy infrastructure that creates many more jobs and on urban sustainable transport, public transport systems. We have to focus on the tail end risks that climate change poses before us to be able to build a more resilient society. For me, 
a sustainable future is about providing universal access to all in a way that's affordable with little or no negative impact to the immediate environment. Access could be in the form of education, energy, transport, and other forms of infrastructure. The recent project in Djibouti, which is a 60 megawatt wind farm project, is one of such examples. When operational, that project will provide the country with 50% of its energy access, as well as help the country to achieve 100% of its energy from renewable energy sources. Thank you. For me, the sustainable future is the future where people can live in harmony with the nature and we know when we protect nature, it's protect our health back. The future where indigenous people rights are recognized and respected because we are driving the traditional knowledge that help us to protect our nature. It is possible because we saw with COVID-19 overnight how the world come together in solidarity and invest in economy. But the green recovery must be a reality for the poor peoples that left behind and the most impacted in terms of health, education, and access to the clean water. It must fight the inequality and justice and marginalizations of the peoples, of indigenous peoples, of my peoples who are living since centuries in these threats. I'm Milan Vakicevic in Podgorica, Montenegro, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Before we hear from our last guest today, a reminder that there is still time to take part in our poll. The question we're asking is what should a sustainable recovery focus on? Boosting jobs, helping the poorest, supporting low carbon economies, or protecting nature? Cast your vote, World Bank Live, and please join Sri Sridhar just a few minutes from now, who will have the final results and will be putting questions you've been submitting directly to Mary Pangestu, the World Bank's Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships, and Hans-Peter Lankis, IFC's Vice President of Economics and Private Sector Development. Our final guest today is Alok Sharma, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for the UK and a Minister for COP26, which will take place next year in Glasgow. Many of the issues we've discussed today will be front and centre as the world's leaders meet at that conference. He shared with us a brief statement on how the international community can support a sustainable recovery from the pandemic on the road to COP26. Thank you very much. The coronavirus pandemic has presented us all with very many challenges, but our recovery offers a chance to reshape the global economy. By investing now to reduce emissions, build resilience and adapt to climate change, we can create jobs and generate growth. At the same time, we can protect the planet for future generations. The international community is absolutely integral to realizing the potential of a global green recovery. Countries, public finance institutions, businesses, civil society, we must all work together towards building back greener. On the 12th of December, the UK and the UN Secretary General will co-host a summit on the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement alongside France, Chile and Italy. And I invite world leaders to use this occasion to announce ambitious and nationally determined contributions, to commit to long-term strategies to get to net zero and to launch adaptation plans. And of course, to also make enhanced commitments on international climate finance beyond 2020. It's critical that donor countries deliver on their commitments and that we collectively demonstrate progress towards that totemic $100 billion a year goal. The UK itself is doubling its international climate finance commitment to 11.6 billion pounds over a five year period. And I hope that many other donor countries will make similar commitments at the event in December. The international financial system is going to be integral to delivering a green recovery. The World Bank Group and regional banks have responded with speed and ambition to the pandemic, making over $200 billion available over the coming year. Now, I believe, 
we must clarify precisely how this funding will support a green, inclusive and resilient global recovery. We need the leadership of the World Bank and the IMF and other financial institutions in guiding countries to develop their recovery plans. Your expertise in finance is going to be absolutely critical in helping climate vulnerable countries build their resilience. We have an opportunity to unite the world to meet shared challenges at this pivotal moment in our shared history. So ahead of COP26, let's work together to make a green recovery a reality around the world, creating a prosperous and sustainable future for our children and grandchildren. We owe that to current and future generations. We're closing today's session with a performance by Malian musician and activist for climate, Ina Moja. Ina Moja has been involved in the Great Green Wall Movement, an effort to grow an 8,000 kilometer wall of trees and plants across the width of Africa, which once complete will be the largest living structure on the planet. We're so honored that she composed the song for us today, reminding us that no matter who or where you are, you're never too small to make a difference. Thank you to all the guests who took part in today's event, and thank you to everyone watching. We hope you've learned something new and have encouraged you to join the conversation. And to keep that conversation going, I'm handing over now to Sri Sridhar, who is live in the atrium of the World Bank Group headquarters in Washington, D.C. Well, Zane, thank you so much. We're back live from the World Bank Group Atrium, and we'll be continuing that discussion on building a truly sustainable recovery with our guests in just a moment. But first, there's still a chance to vote in today's poll. We're asking, what should a sustainable recovery focus on? So head on over to World Bank Live to share your opinion, and we'll be returning to the results of that vote in just a few minutes. But first, I am delighted to welcome Mari Pangestu, who is the World Bank's Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnerships, and Hans-Peter Lankes, who is the Vice President for Economics and Private Sector Development at the International Finance Corporation, or IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Mari, Hans-Peter, a warm welcome to you both. Hello. 
Hello, Sri. <laughs> so, you know, today we're talking all about sustainability and how we can ensure a sustainable recovery for people and the planet. Um, Mari, let me start off by asking you, we've got a question from two of our online audience members, Maria Corazon and Madhavi, and they want to know, is sustainable development still possible amidst this pandemic and also amidst climate change? And what do you think are some strategies to ensure that the path to recovery is sustainable? I think it's very possible. It, it's in fact, uh, an opportunity uh, as we are going to be designing the relief and the recovery plans uh, to, to respond to the pandemic. It's actually an opportunity to have sustainable recovery. Uh, what does that really mean? I think what it really means is we need to invest, not just invest back in, in, in physical or financial capital, but also natural capital, human capital and social capital. And when you talk about natural capital, what you're talking about is the possibility that low carbon uh, development path is not a trade-off to growth and jobs. Uh, and, and you can do that if you really design your policies in the right way. I'll give you some examples. We could repurpose uh, the uh, uh, distorting subsidies on fuel and agriculture and repurpose it, uh, say, for sustainable agriculture and have higher food growth but low carbon emission at the same time. Or we could be investing in uh, degraded lands and seascapes, which in the end will have, uh, it will create jobs as we are doing it. You know, so there's a lot of stimulus, right, uh, in the recovery. So a lot of the stimulus in the infrastructure building can be both creating jobs and rebuilding infrastructure in a more sustainable way. Right, Mara, you know, going off of that, let's talk about biodiversity in particular. Why do you believe it's so important for economies and communities in general? Well, let me quote a, a tagline from the CI. Uh, Mother nature doesn't need people, but people need Mother nature. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we need healthy soils to grow our food. We need clean air and clean water for healthy living. So people need uh, uh, natural ecosystems to be healthy. Uh, and there's the economic value, uh, not to mention that. Uh, and our uh, recent estimates are showing that actually uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services, uh, if they're healthy, they will also benefit the economy. And in fact, if they collapse, if the ecosystem services collapse, which is the forest, the pollination and the marine fisheries, you can lose 20% uh, uh, of your GDP growth. So there's an economic uh, a rationale for it as well. Absolutely. Um, Hans-Peter, let me now turn it over to you and ask, um, how do you think companies and investors should be thinking about climate and biodiversity issues as we go through this pandemic? Um, so I'm going to sound very much like Mary because this is really both a private and a public sector yes. issue. And we've learned uh, a whole lot and companies have learned a whole lot over the past couple of decades about the relationship between investment and climate objectives. And one thing that's fascinating is we found out it's an investment opportunity. It's not an imposition. There was a lot of talk um, for a long time about the cost of climate adjustment. No, it's turned more and more into an opportunity that's understood by companies. And it's an opportunity both for the bottom line and for the planet and for jobs. And that makes it a potent tool in the recovery. So one thing that we, we know from the, um, the New Climate uh, Economy, a, a publication by the Global Commission on Climate and Economy, is that there, there are $26 trillion worth of added value investment opportunities between now and 2030 in the climate economy. And those the Commission expects to create 65 million jobs above what business as usual would produce. And what's interesting, if you look at the last, the global financial crisis, um, the investments in stimulus after that crisis that went into renewable energy produced almost three times more jobs per million dollar invested than those investments that went into fossil fuel technology. So it's a job creator and it's an opportunity for the recovery. At the same time, it's an opportunity for the, climate, for the, for the planet. Absolutely. Um, Mari, let me now turn it back to you. Uh, I mean, given the focus on COVID-19 right now, how would you say that the World Bank Group is meeting its climate commitments as well? Uh, we remain uh, very highly committed. And in FY20, 
uh, we delivered $21 billion worth of uh, our lending, which has climate uh, co-benefits. And that's 30% of our total lending. And it's actually the highest ever in World Bank history uh, in wow. terms of uh, climate-related uh, investments. So you can see that we, we remain committed. Uh, and in the last five years, actually, uh, the number was $85 billion. And in the next five years, we are really, really committed uh, to uh, maintaining it and increasing it. And how do we plan to do that? Uh, it has been all the way from the president down uh, to the managing directors and to the uh, operationals, operation uh, units, that you need to put uh, climate change uh, front and center in all the programs, people and, and the uh, impact of climate change uh, front and center uh, in your programs. So uh, we are, our climate change team uh, is working very hard to uh, work together with the teams to find the opportunities uh, for climate action. You can think about, you know, the livelihood programs where in terms of the pandemic, uh, we are assisting a lot of the poor and vulnerable and we focus on areas where there's also disaster or where uh, areas where there's climate, uh, climate risk. Because our most recent poverty report actually shows that uh, uh, poverty is going to increase uh, for the first time uh, for in a long time. Uh, and it's due to the three C's, COVID, conflict and climate so uh, we really need to double up our efforts to address this and try to achieve uh, all three. Maybe my final example, just because I think it's, 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 a, it's a good example where you can achieve all three, uh, uh, is, is cook cooking, huh? right? Clean cooking, that's one of our initiatives uh, also, that you know, 70% of women in Africa are actually cooking in, uh, using uh, fossil fuel, which is very, very unhealthy for them. Uh, so going to clean cooking uh, has the benefit of gender, uh, healthy health, as well as climate. So you know, that, that's an example of where you can achieve uh, many objectives uh, if you put your mind to it uh, and, and really uh, integrate the climate action into all our programs. Oh, absolutely. Um, Hans-Peter, let me get your thoughts on this. I mean, what do you think is needed for companies and investors to scale up climate financing to meet the world's global climate goals? So I think it's, uh, it's quite clear you need to work both on the real sector side. You need to have projects to invest in. You need to help develop project pipelines and you need to have the finance. Uh, and on the project pipelines I mentioned uh, a little bit before, there is a lot of opportunity and it goes well beyond energy. Uh, green buildings, for instance, is a great, a very large opportunity that helps to save money while investing in it. Um, smart agriculture, uh, there's a lot of technology driven uh, climate impact uh, investment that we can tap into. Um, carbon capture is beginning to be a real opportunity. Uh, distributed energy uh, grids, etc. So those projects, they need to be prepared and there's a lot of work to do on that front. But finance has to be there as well and it has grown really fast. So Moody's um, expects this year the, the combined uh, green bond uh, and sustainable bond market to reach about $400 billion. And that is up from very little just a few years ago. So it's a very rapid uh, growth. And there is a lot of space to further grow into, especially in emerging markets. And um, now how do you tap that space? That um, you can, as an MDB, you can issue green bonds and then invest those in green projects. You can also work with um, financial institutions and corporates in emerging markets and help them to uh, structure their, their projects so that they can issue these bonds. And third, and I think most importantly, if we want to scale, mm. you can work on both sides at the same time. You can tap institutional investors like IFC has done with Amundi or we're doing right now with HSBC and create a, a source of, uh, of funding from institutional investors. And at the same time, you work on the supply of, uh, of bonds and of projects to invest in. That I think we have to scale up and it's, it's eminently scalable. It's, very, uh, it's, a, it's a model that works. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, now, I want to bring the youth into the conversation here. And so I want to ask this question to both you, Mari, and also Hans-Peter. Uh, it's a question from one of our online, uh, online members, Absamid Dahir, wants to know how can youth contribute to regenerating economic growth in a sustainable manner? Mari, let me start with you. 
Uh, I think youth uh, plays a very important uh, role. Uh, I, I always tell people, all of us need in our countries uh, to, to remind our politicians and policymakers, we all need a Greta. <laughs> and you know, I, for, a long, for the longest time, my own uh, children have been the ones that always remind us uh, about our, our, our uh, non-environmental-friendly uh, 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 environmental uh, environmental behavior, right? So I think youth play a very important role and they can play a role in many ways. I think one is uh, uh, as a voice. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened in Europe is actually, uh, you know, you, you can see the, the shift uh, in, in, in politics and policy making. Uh, a lot of it was driven by youth. Uh, I remember a survey done in Europe where uh, of youth, uh, where they placed uh, better quality life as higher than mm -hmm. earning more income or success in their career. So that shows you uh, where their values are, right? Uh, and they can do al a lot also in terms of advocacy and action. And I would say entering into politics, because you know sometimes uh, we, we have a lot of discussion with the youth and they, they always say, oh, they, they're very distrustful of the government, of, of politics. And then we, we challenge them, look, if you want to change things, you better enter into where you can make the change and, and, and therefore have uh, what we just talked about earlier. How can we have low carbon uh, development path as well as growth and jobs, right? You can do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hans Peter had lots of good examples there. We can do it, uh, but it, it requires political commitment and change in the way we do our policies and the way we measure natural capital, physical capital, and social capital. So I, I really think our hope is the youth. <laughs> That's great, Mari. Hans Peter, what about you? Yes, I mean, totally. Uh, youth, they have to push. They're also much better able to act, uh, not just talk. I think youth is, is, a, is a, a great motor of change. Um, and if you look and, and, and invest, if you look at um, the uh, institutional investor base, uh, there have been uh, surveys done on the preferences of the baby boom generation versus the preferences of the millennials who are now beginning to inherit that wealth. There's a huge difference. So impact investing, for instance, which is a very rapidly growing sector of finance, is driven by the millennial generation. It's because 40 to 50% of millennials say that they want to have an impact, not just make the money. Uh, that compares with 10, 15% of baby boomers in these surveys. So youth is really driving change in a, in a, in a way uh, through, through their voice, through their action, and through their investment. And perhaps one last uh, point, which may sound a, a, a bit uh, sort of niche, but is important. I think uh, technology is going to be really important in bringing solutions mm -hmm. and ideas. The best ideas come when you're young. You know, there are lots yeah. of studies about that. You know, below 35 is that you make, you, you make your Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, inventions. So youth is, yeah. is the one that has to come with the ideas. If I can add one more point yes, on that, because uh, you, you just reminded me of another point. Youth, you know, people, young professionals entering into the, into the workforce and, and choosing companies, they will choose companies which they think are more sustainable, mm -hmm. right? Uh, having a good corporate sustainability record. So I think that's another way they, they can also vote with their feet, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Mari, Hans, Peter, I think this is a strong note to end on. I want to thank you both again so much for joining me here today. Thank you, Shri. It's a pleasure, Shri. I am Kennedy Olo in Nairobi, Kenya, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Well, it's time now to take our trip around the world, highlighting the development challenges and triumphs of individual countries. Today, we're connected to Romania, and it's from the capital city of Bucharest that country manager Tatiana Poskuryakova recently spoke to my colleague, Paul Blake. He started by asking her about the nature of the World Bank's work in an EU member country like Romania. Indeed, Paul, uh, Romania is an EU member state and actually we're very excited because this year uh, it was for the first time classified as a high income country. And in many ways, our program is uh, different in Romania from what we do in other countries. And there are two particular ways in which our program is different. The first one, we have to be extremely selective and very catalytic with everything we do in Romania. Let me explain what I mean. Catalytic means that we, with our program, we're trying to help Romania use European funds effectively and strategically, and also attract private investment. And when I say that we are selective, it means that we are, 
have a single focus. We're trying to focus on the one remaining constraint, which is stopping Romania from graduating from IBRD borrowing and becoming an IDA donor. And in Romania, this uh, constraint is the weakness of public institutions in Romania. So what we apply is what we call a institution filter. This means that we refuse to support any project, be it fun financing or knowledge in Romania, unless we can demonstrate that it strengthens a public institution in Romania. Let me give you an example from our subnational program. The urban team is now working with the city of Constanza to strengthen their planning capacity and investment cap capacity. And already, even though the project is still ongoing, the city of Constanza was able to generate 80 million euro in new investment. Uh, and they're now much better positioned to also compete for European funding. The second feature which makes our program in Romania different is our strong focus on knowledge. Working here, we generate a lot of lessons and models that can be applied outside of the borders of Romania. Let me give you an example from the education sector. We have a wonderful project here called ROSE, Romania Secondary Education Project, which has developed a model that allows school principals to benefit from discretionary funding and some uh, methodological advice to stop kids from dropping out early from school and to help more children graduate. And the government of Romania with our support has shared this model with the government of North Macedonia. And in fact, now we are developing a project together, uh, the World Bank and the government of North Macedonia to implement the ROSE model in North Macedonia. This is just two examples, but we try to do both catalytic engagements, strategic engagements and knowledge generation and knowledge spillovers as we call it, throughout our portfolio. So catalytic and selective and sharing a lot of that knowledge. I, I want to briefly, while I've got you, ask you, ask you about COVID-19. The, the pandemic has meant you've had to enact a very, very rapid response. Now, I understand you guys have used a sort of financing mechanism that's typically reserved for like natural disasters, like an earthquake or a big storm. Talk to me a little bit about this and, and how and why it was so innovative in responding to COVID-19. Indeed, Paul, we were very lucky in Romania that we had an instrument called CAD DDO, which was developed well before the pandemic. And in fact, when we developed it, uh, it was not even, uh, we, we didn't think about pandemic as, as, as a risk. We were thinking about the seismic risk primarily. But the idea of the CAD DDO is to put money aside. It's a contingent funding that is available for very rapid disbursement within 24 hours when the disaster uh, hits. And in fact, what happened was that the disaster that hit Romania was in fact not the earthquake, but the pandemic. And we could not possibly have pre prepared um, an emergency response operation in 24 hours, but because we had money on hold, we made it available to Romania immediately and helped the government prepare much better for the first wave of the pandemic than they would otherwise have done. What I want to tell you, though, is that CADDO was only one part of our comprehensive response. It was the fastest thing we could do, but we then restructured the rest of our investment portfolio, particularly in health and education, to make additional funding available for COVID response. Perhaps more importantly, we also provided a lot of just-in-time advice. We are running this uh, rapid assessment survey to make sure we understand how COVID epidemic is impacting the most vulnerable communities. And this informs the government's response. And we also helped, for example, model school reopening uh, scenarios for Romania, which are now being deployed as we speak. So it's, CADIDIO was a very useful and rapid uh, uh, instrument, but only one part of our response to the COVID pandemic. And Tatiana, you talked there about schools reopening. You know, as the, the pandemic passes in, in the next few months, hopefully not the next few years, but in the next few months, what are some of the, the key priorities for you and your work in Romania? So, Paul, we talk about Romania as an EU member state and a high income country. But having said that, Romania still has a very large unfinished agenda. Infrastructure agenda has not been tackled. Uh, fiscal consolidation is going to be a challenge. How do you bring down fiscal deficits without uh, jeopardizing economic recovery? These are all questions that will loom very large for Romania. But if you ask me to pick one challenge, I would definitely say that investment in education is where we need to focus. You may be surprised to know, but uh, Romania is scoring very low on human capital index, not just in the EU, but in ECA. And also, if you look at, for example, results of PISA, uh, International Student Assessment, you will see that 41% of 15-year-olds in Romania have been classified as functionally illiterate. And for rural areas where half the children study, the number is 70%. We think that after COVID, the situation will deteriorate even further, and we expect more than half of young people in Romania to not be able to pass the basic literacy test. Now, 
it's impossible in this day and age to succeed as a country to compete and to provide good standard of living for your people without uh, huge investments in education and turning around this trend. So this is what I would really like to focus on. Luckily, the ROSE project that I mentioned before provides a really good model. So I would really like to streamline this model and help Romania turn around this trend in education. We've talked now about some of the challenges. Let's talk about a, a, an optimistic note. What's the best part of, of working in Romania? Well, that's a very easy question. The best part of, of working in the World Bank and in Romania for me is seeing my team every day. I smile every morning when I think that I will see them. Uh, and I think we're blessed in the World Bank to be working every day with such smart, warm and creative people. And Romania team is definitely up there with the best of them. I always think that whatever lemons life throws at us, we will be able to make lemonade. And that certainly is a reason for me to be happy every day. Tatiana, thank you so much for taking the time today. Really grateful for it. Thank you, Paul. Now, while there might not be thousands here with us this year, the conversation has continued online. And across it all is Papsi Mariano, who is back here live with me. Papsi, good to see you again. Hi again. So Papsi, the poll today asked, what should a sustainable recovery focus on? I know people have been voting, so what are they saying? So let's remind people what their choices were. So first, is it boosting jobs, then helping the poorest, or supporting low carbon economies, or protecting nature? So out of six 6,512 votes across all our platforms. The clear top answer was boosting jobs. Wow, and I voted for, I think it was protecting nature. I did too, but it comes in second with 28% oh. of all the votes. Wow, good to know. Now, uh, we are answering audience questions all throughout the week. You told me earlier that uh, one of the best things folks can do is get their question in early. So tell me what events are still coming up? Yes, so for the events coming up, um, we're getting our questions early as well. So another pro tip is to be relevant for that day, right? So on that end tomorrow, we're looking at health, education and social protection, specifically how they've been impacted by COVID-19. And then Friday is all about digital development. So get those questions in about tech and developing uh, the developing world. And on Saturday, we're marking End Poverty Day with expert analysis of the latest data. So you can find the full schedule and importantly, put in your questions on World Bank Live. Absolutely. And now before I let you go, tell me more about the digital mosaic. I see it's filling up fast. It is, but there's still time to add your photo. So if you have something to share about resilience, show us with a photo, go to live.worldbank.org forward slash mosaic. And if you just want a boost of inspiration today, go check the submissions out because there are really very compelling stories that I hope we can show throughout the next few days. Oh, I bet. That sounds great, Papsi. Thank you again so much. Well, folks, that's it for today. I'm Srimathi Sridhar in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to take part in the second day of the 2020 World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. Now, we hope you'll join us again tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern. That's 1600 GMT when, as Papsi noted, we'll be taking a closer look at human capital amidst COVID-19. Until then, goodbye from Washington. From Mexico City. It's in Athens, Greece. In Lome, Togo.
from Mexico City. It's in Athens, Greece. In Lome, Togo. from Mexico City. It's in Athens, Greece. In Lome, Togo.